everybody, it's Dr. Gilchrist, and as promised, uh, I'm recording this for you uh, for Wednesday, since we will not be having class, I will be attending the workshop. So uh, the last time that we were here, we were in our Lecture 17 slides, which we're going to finish up today, and then we're going to start talking about hearing, which we will continue on Friday. So the last time that we were here, we were talking about extra striate cortex and the difference in our dorsal stream, which is largely used for things like object location or our relationship to objects in space. And then we also have our ventral stream, which is critical for things like object recognition. To help you learn a little bit more about the ventral stream and the dorsal stream, I've highlighted two different disorders that happen in each stream based on patterns of brain damage. So the last time that we were here, we talked about achromatopsia, which typically occurs due to damage to area V4. And then we also talked about various types of agnosia, which are damaged, um, which uh, usually results due to damage in the inferior temporal cortex. Today, we're going to talk about disorders that happen due to damage to the dorsal stream, our wear pathway, and that's going to be akinetopsia, which occurs due to damage to V5, and the posterior parietal cortex, which is responsible um, when damaged for a disorder known as neglect. We're going to start with akinetopsia. So akinetopsia is often the result of brain damage to cortical area V5. So again, that extra striate cortex area V5. People that have this disorder are effectively motion blind. So they do not see a smooth change in an object's visual position over time, which is what motion is. It's just a change in an object's position over time. But Whereas you and I can see that motion very smoothly, somebody with akinetopsia will not. They will kind of see the world uh, through a strobe light where instead of seeing my hand move smoothly across the screen, they're going to see my hand here, and then suddenly it'll be here, and then suddenly it'll be here. So these patients that have damage to this area lack the ability to see smooth motion. So they may have difficulty uh, with things like pouring tea or coffee because they'll take one glance away and then all of a sudden their coffee cup will be overflowing. They're obviously going to have some difficulty with things like driving as well. And here's kind of a better metric to see area V5. So here is our occipital lobe, and you can see that we are starting to begin a more dorsal track in the brain. Our ventral stream will be heading down the inferior temporal cortex. This will be moving towards the posterior parietal cortex as part of that dorsal stream. So V5 is considered part of that dorsal stream. So now we're going to finish up by talking about hemispatial neglect. It is also referred to as hemifield neglect or unilateral neglect. Now, because the right hemisphere tends to be more responsible for visual stimuli and visual imagery, um, we do know that this specifically happens due to damage to the right posterior parietal cortex. And this is going to result in a variety of different types of symptoms. Somebody's eyes, head, and body are going to be more oriented to the right. These people are not going to pay attention to the left half of visual space. Although, if you have an object that is in your right hemisphere, and you've shifted over to the left, people will be able to continue orienting to that object as long as there's not a lot of competition. So remember that when we damage the right side of the visual system, that is going to affect our left visual field. So damage to the right posterior parietal cortex means that your eyes and your head will not pay attention to the left side of space. Um, you are going to orient, you're not going to orient or pay attention to the left side of stimuli, and you're going to have difficulty searching the left hemispace or left hemifield. So you're not really going to pay a lot of attention to the left visual field. Now, as a reminder, these people are not blind. 
If you turn them around so that what's in their left side of visual space is now in their right, they will pay attention to it. This is not a blindness issue. This is a failure to allocate attention to the left half of visual space. So for example, if we're doing line bisection, so this is a very, very easy task that we get patients to do. We give them a horizontal line and we tell them to draw a vertical line that cuts the line in half and perfectly bisects it. As you can kind of see here, they have done it in such a way that it's a quarter of the visual space. Now that's because they're not paying attention to the left half of the line. To them, this is all there is this component right here and they have bisected what they believe the line is because they're not paying attention to the left half of that line additionally if you ask them to draw uh, different figures or copy different figures um, you will notice that there is more time devoted to the right half of that space than there is to the left half of that space um, and what you are looking at here is a painter by the name of Radderscheid. Um, he had a stroke in his posterior parietal cortex on his right side. So you can actually see his neglect and how he got better over time. So he had a right parietal stroke. You can see that at two months, He's really only paying attention to the right half of space. And by the time we get to nine months, he's paying more attention to the left half of space. But do notice that there's still more detail um, on, the on the right half of space. So here is where the right posterior parietal cortex is. As you can see, it's a little bit higher up from V5 in this case. So folks, that is all I had for uh, lecture 17. Now we are actually going to talk about hearing. If you want to be really technical, though, the technical term for hearing is audition. It is our auditory process. So we're going to start um, kind of as we talked about with vision. Vision, we're taking physical stimulus energy in the form of light, and we are basically processing the light waves that are being reflected on different surfaces. In the case of hearing, the physical stimulus energy and the goal of your auditory system is to perceive sound. This happens because any time that sound is produced, um, there's some kind of vibration going on. So if you hear yourself talk, part of the reason that we are able to hear ourselves is because of the vibration and the voicing of our vocal folds and our larynx, which you might know as the voice box. So we have these vibrating objects that set molecules of air into motion. Those molecular collisions are going to be critical for us to be able to hear. So um, these vibrations could be things like vocal cords, a tuning fork, etc. And we know that sound waves uh, travel about 700 miles per hour. To put this into perspective, light is about 700 million miles per hour. And sound waves are going to travel as a longitudinal wave. You're going to see me do this a lot because this is the form of a sine wave. And because of the way that the sound wave travels through the air, we are going to have areas where molecules of air are very tightly compressed, what we call condensation. And we also have areas where the molecules are very expanded and far away from each other called rarefication. These collisions are going to be critical for us to hear sound. So what you're kind of looking at here, you have the speaker that is producing sound. So these are the sound waves. Now, because the sound wave is moving, you can see that there are areas of compression right here where the molecules are really close to each other. And we have areas of expansion or rarefication of those molecules. Um, so we're always going to have these alternating things. And another thing that I will mention is that there is no such thing in real life as a pure tone. Most of the time, the sounds that we hear are made up of different mixtures of tones. So this speaker is producing sound, um, but when the source actually moves forward, 
like a tuning fork or a speaker, it's actually going to push air molecules horizontally to the right, and it's going to create that high pressure area where everything is very highly compressed. Um, the backward retraction of the speaker will create a low pressure area. So basically the speaker is vibrating and moving as it produces sound. That's going to cause these high pressure areas as it moves forward, and then it's gonna produce low pressure areas as it retracts. And that's going to uh, cause the molecules to move. So this continuous arrival of high and low pressure regions of compression and that rarefication are gonna set the eardrum in our ear canal into motion um, at the and it's going to vibrate at the frequency of whatever the source is producing. So let's talk a little bit about the different perceptions and properties of sound before we talk about the components of the ear. So uh, first of all, we have our perception of loudness. This is our perception of intensity. So how intense the sound is or how big the amplitude is. And I will show you examples of what high amplitude and low amplitude waveforms look like on the next slide. Pitch is our perception of frequency. Frequency is often for sound going to be measured in hertz. Another way to think of hertz is the number of cycles, those numbers of up and down repetitions per second. For our human range, you and I can hear sounds as low as 20 hertz and sounds as high as 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. Then we have timbre. So it's not pronounced timber, it's pronounced timbre. Timbre is our perception of how complex the sound is. So for an example, I play the tuba. I also know some people who play the flute. Now, when we are tuning up, we are all playing the exact same note or the exact same fundamental frequency. But I can still tell what a flute sounds like and I can still tell what my tuba sounds like. And that's because of timbre. We have the fundamental frequency that every instrument is playing, but for my particular instrument, there are additional harmonic frequencies to create a more complex sound. You being able to tell the difference between a flute and a tuba playing the same note is you engaging in perceiving timbre. And then finally, we have the duration of the sound, how long the sound actually lasts. So let's talk about what these look like with respect to sound waves. I'm going to move my head so that you can see this a little bit more. So if we're talking about amplitude, that is the physical dimension of intensity. And you and I are going to perceive this as loudness. So you can see that loud sounds have a very high amplitude. That waveform peaks at a very high rate. Softer sounds that are lower in intensity or loudness will have a lower amplitude. Here is frequency, which is our, our perception of pitch. So pitch is, oop, our pitch is our perception of frequency. So loudness is our perception of amplitude. Pitch is our perception of frequency. So here we have a low frequency sound. This is going to be very low pitched because we have very few alternations of up and down waves. You can see that we only have about one repetition here. Here with a high frequency sound, we have many of those alternations of high and low waves. And so because of that, we get more of those up and down cycles per second, indicating a higher frequency. Timbre is our perception of a sound's complexity and the multiple frequencies that often make up different sounds. So for a simple sound, we might have something like a sine wave, which sounds like a very simple tone. Most, most of the tones that are simple tones are usually going to be computer generated as we don't have pure tones in everyday life. Most of the sounds that we are going to encounter are complex and as you can see here are made up of different frequencies that add together and mix together. So now we're going to talk about the different parts of the ear. So I'm going to spend a lot of time here just to really make sure that you got it. And because this is recorded, you can go back and listen to this anytime that you want. 
So most people tend to think of this portion right here that I'm wiggling as our ear. That is not actually true. Our ears are a much bigger structure than just this. This is our pinna and it's part of the outer ear. So the pinna is the external ear that we can see. Its job is to funnel in sounds from the environment. So if you actually feel around your pinna, or if you look at somebody's pinna, everybody's pinna has a variety of different grooves in it. The goal is to, the goal of having those grooves is to help funnel those sounds into the ear canal. Um, remember that the ear is gonna be made of cartilage and it is connected to the ear canal. So sounds are gonna be funneled into the pinna, into the ear canal, where they make contact with the tympanic membrane, better known to you as the eardrum. So this is a tiny little flap of skin. If it's damaged, it can heal itself. So if you rupture your eardrum, it will heal, but it's not gonna feel very good um, when you rupture it. Um, so as sounds enter the ear canal, they are vibrating. As we mentioned, anytime that you're hearing a sound, you're getting those high pressure and low pressure areas of air molecules, and those are gonna cause vibrations. That's gonna cause the eardrum to vibrate. So those vibrations are gonna be transmitted from the eardrum to the bones of the middle ear. So once we get to the eardrum, we're pretty much done with the outer ear, and we're moving on to the bones of the middle ear. These bones are called the ossicles um, and they vibrate as the eardrum moves. So the eardrum is going to move and it's going to cause these little bones to move. As we'll talk about a little bit later, their job is to pump like a piston. Um, the inner ear is filled with fluid and at, so far we've been dealing with air. If you've ever played Marco Polo with your friends and you've ducked your head underwater, you should probably know that sound is going to lose some of its energy as it crosses from air into fluid. Fluid in liquid, molecules are more tightly packed together and that means that sound as it travels from air into fluid will lose its quality. So we have these bones of the middle ear to basically amplify the sounds so that when these sounds get transmitted to the inner ear, they don't lose their quality. So first we have the malleus, which is directly attached to the eardrum. Another term for this is the hammer. And um, then we have our incus or the anvil, and this is located between the malleus and then our final bone, the stapes or the stirrup. As you can see, kind of looks like a stirrup. You actually look like you could stick your foot in there. The stirrup is attached to the oval window of one of the portions of our inner ear, the cochlea. The cochlea is the component of our inner ear. It is snail shaped, it is filled with fluid, and it is made of bone. So it's the primary structure of our inner ear, and it contains the sensory receptor neurons that will turn sound waves into a signal that the brain can actually understand. Um, those receptors, by the way, are gonna be called hair cells, and we'll talk about why they're called hair cells. Now I mentioned the oval window of the cochlea. This is an opening that is covered by a thin membrane and the stapes is attached to that membrane. So as the eardrum moves, the bones of the middle ear will move and that will cause the stapes to move and transmit those sound vibrations into the cochlea by constantly pushing and pulling onto that membrane. So here are the bones of the inner ear. You can see them here. So we have our malleus or our hammer. We have our incus or our anvil. And as you can see, it is a little anvil shaped. And then we have the stapes or the stirrup. As you can see, it very much looks like a stirrup. So just as a reminder, Remember that like the outer ear, the middle ear is filled with air. So here are our major components of the ear. So we have our outer ear, which is made up of the pinna, the ear canal, and the tympanic membrane. 
We have our middle ear, which, like the outer ear, is filled with air. And we have our ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And then finally, we have our inner ear, which is filled with fluid, and that is largely the cochlea. So I want to talk a little bit more about the relationship between the eardrum and the ossicles. Here's the sequence for how sound waves travel into the ear. So sound waves are funneled into the pinna. They travel into the ear canal, which causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate. That causes the ossicles that are attached to pump like a piston, which then transmit those vibrations into the oval window of the cochlea. So as I mentioned earlier, the signal needs amplification in order to have an effect on the cochlea. We're moving from air into fluid, and unless we have this signal amplification, we're going to lose that quality of that sound. We're going to lose its intensity. So one of the things that you need to know is that the tympanic membrane is about 16 times larger than the oval window of the cochlea. By moving from a larger membrane to a smaller membrane, uh, the vibration of the ossicles is amplified and the oval membrane is going to move a lot. So for example, um, you can think about somebody very large wearing very tiny stiletto shoes. We're going from a larger membrane to a much smaller membrane. When you wear high heels, you're putting a lot of extra pressure on those tiny points of those stilettos. So the ossicles amplify low intensity sound by increasing that pressure on the oval window. So again, here's kind of the relationship between the outer and middle ear chambers. So here we have our outer ear. Here we have our middle ear cavity. Just as a reminder, here is the entire tympanic membrane. And notice that how much smaller the oval window actually is. And then we have our three different components of our inner ear in the cochlea. We have the upper portion, which is called the scala vestibuli. We have the bottom portion, which is called the scala tympani, and then we have the center, which is sometimes called the organ of corti or the cochlear duct. So something that I'll kind of mention with respect to our uh, tympanic membrane, here's an actual view of it. Um, you can actually see the malleus attached just behind that membrane. Um, as I mentioned, um, the tympanic membrane, your eardrum, can develop holes or ruptures. And this will usually happen when you have pressure building inside of the eustachian tubes, which connect the middle ear to the throat. Um, usually this will happen because of something like an ear infection, um, or it might be because of a sinus infection or a cold, and then you get on a plane and those pressure changes really cause problems with the eustachian tubes. Um, because this is basically like skin, it does heal. It does take a little while and it's not necessarily very pleasant when it does though. So next, I just want to show you one other thing about the ossicles in this picture. So here's how they actually are uh, matched up. Um, so notice that the surface of both the malleus and the stapes are going to be flat. So here, uh, here is our malleus. So you can actually see that it's pretty flat because it's going to attach to that eardrum. Likewise, here is the flat portion of the stapes. You can see that that's also pretty flat because it's going to be attaching to that oval window. Now, next we're going to talk about the cochlea. Here is an image of what it actually looks like. Uh, it does actually look a bit like a snail shell. And again, so just to reorient you, we talked about the outer ear, we talked about the middle ear, and now we're actually going to talk about the components of the inner ear where sound waves are basically transduced. So remember that we're taking that physical stimulus energy and we're turning it into a signal that the brain can actually use. We're transducing sound waves into electricity for the auditory nerve to basically carry to the brain. So if we take a cross section of the cochlea like this, these are going to be the major components of your cochlea. So we have our um, scala vestibuli, and this is where the oval window is contained. 
We have the scalamedia, which is the middle portion. Um, this contains a structure, this contains a fluid that's known as endolymph. Endolymph um, is a lot like extracellular fluid that we would see in the central nervous system. The only difference between endolymph and extracellular fluid that we've already talked about is that endolymph contains a high amount of potassium. So as we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, potassium is going to be the major ion that plays a role in the hearing process. This is a little bit different from when we talked about vision, where sodium and potassium were a big part of that process. In endolymph, it's largely going to be potassium. Um, and, and endolymph is full of potassium. So then we have, so we have our scala vestibuli, our scala media, and then we have our scala tympani. The scala tympani is in contact with the round window. The round window is another opening in the bone of the cochlea. And the reason that we need a round window is we need to make sure that fluid doesn't get compressed in the cochlea. Fluid needs to be able to move freely in the cochlea for us to be able to hear sound. So as we have the oval window pushing in, we need another membrane to be pushing out so that that fluid can move freely. And I'll show you a picture of both the oval and the round window later. Um, so the receptor neurons are going to be located in a special structure in the scala media called the organ of corti. Um, and basically, the organ of corti is comprised of the basilar membrane, which is right here, um, the sensory neurons that are called hair cells, and a tactorial membrane that sits above the hair cells. So the hair cells, as you can see, they get their name because they have these hair-like appendages called cilia that extend into the tactorial membrane. Um, so the hair cells, the cilia, are basically the dendrites of a neuron whose axons, as you can kind of see here, group together to form the auditory nerve. So the auditory nerve is going to receive the neurotransmitter output of the hair cells. So here's kind of another way to look at the organ of corti. So again, this is gonna be located in the scala media, the central portion of the cochlea. We have the bottom, which is our basilar membrane. We have our hair cells, and as you can kind of see in the previous figure, we have outer hair cells and inner hair cells. The inner hair cells are going to be the most important part of this. Um, and then all of the hair cells are embedded in the tectorial membrane, which sits right on top of them. Now, if we were able to uncoil the cochlea, which we can't, it's made of bone, that's not going to work, but if we could hypothetically uncoil it, you can actually see the direction of the movement of fluid. So here we have sound waves striking the eardrum, the malleus, the incus, and then the stapes move. The stapes is going to vibrate against the oval window, and that's going to cause the fluid in the cochlea to move. So it's going to move in this direction, it's going to circle around what we call the apex or the helicotrema. And then it's going to circle all the way around and it's going to cause the, the round window, which is located in the scala tympani, to push outward. So this fluid is able to move freely because we have these two membranes working together. All right. So remember how sound works so far. So sound vibrates the tympanic membrane, which sets the three ossicles in motion. The stapes um, is attached to the membrane of the oval window, and that causes um, the, the fluid inside of the scala vestibuli to move. This motion is going to circle through the scala vestibuli at the apex, and then the scala tympani, um, and this movement of fluid causes the basilar membrane in the organ of corti to move. When the oval window is pushed in by a sound wave, the round window is going to push out. And you have to do that or else the fluid is not able to move. So as one pushes in, the other pushes out. Otherwise, it wouldn't go anywhere and we wouldn't be able to hear anything.
So the fluid stays inside the cochlea the whole time. It just pushes and pulls against the windows. And the basilar membrane moves like a traveling ocean wave. And one of the other things that we know about the basilar membrane is that it has a different uh, structure at the base versus at its apex. So here's our, uh, here's our oval window right here. At this point, at the base of the cochlea, the basilar membrane is very thin and stiff, which means it's going to be a lot more responsive for high frequencies. The apex of the cochlea at the center of the cochlea is very wide and floppy, and it turns out that this is going to be best for low frequencies. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here. We'll talk some more about why the basilar membrane codes for certain frequencies and why it is structured that way. So make sure that you watch this and we will pick up on this on Friday. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.